All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm here to speak to you this morning about uh, novel multi-region clusters. Uh, so that's Cassandra deployment split between heterogeneous data centers with uh, uh, network address translation and DNS service discovery. So my name's Adam Zeglin. I'm the co-founder and VP of engineering at InstaCluster. Uh, InstaCluster is a company that provides uh, Cassandra as a service in the cloud. Uh, currently we do that on Amazon Web Services, but we've got Google Compute in private beta. Uh, we currently manage uh, about 50 Cassandra nodes. Uh, we get a lot of feature requests from our customers, right, and we try to make those happen. So one of those things that we've been playing around with is, so this is a bit of an experiment that I'd like to share with you, is how to do multi-DC at InstaCluster. Um, like, we want to be able to do multi-DC clusters that, between data centers that don't follow the standard like traditional DC model. And what I mean by that is data centers where each of the compute instances inside them don't all have public IP addresses allocated. Uh, so currently, as I said, InstaCluster, we only deploy in cloud environments, but we want to allow our customers to bridge nodes located in their private DCs into an InstaCluster managed cloud data center either as a way to extend out into the cloud or bring the cloud into your data center, basically to kind of burst out into the cloud. Cloud-to-cloud uh, -cloud deployments is actually kind of easy. Uh, Cloud-to-traditional data centers is also pretty easy, but private cloud uh, is kind of, sorry, private to cloud is typically difficult. And that, the reason for that is, unless you've got per node IP addresses, you kind of, you've got connectivity problems. Um, so what, what are some of the solutions there? You know, you've got VPNs, or is there something else, right? So like I said, this is kind of an experimental concept that we've been playing around with. It's kind of in private beta. We haven't actually uh, used it in production. Uh, and th the idea is to use uh, network address translation and DNS service discovery to kind of do uh, node uh, discovery and connectivity. So what, today what I'd like to talk to you about is kind of just give you a quick recap of the current multi-DC kind of support in Cassandra and then run through some of the alternate solutions that we kind of, kind of looked at and then give you a brief overview of network address translation and DNSSD and then kind of a high level look at our implementation. So let's kind of start with the basics, right, just as a kind of quick recap. So what is a single node cluster? Well, this is what you get when you kind of do app get install Cassandra on a machine. Uh, this is really kind of, so this is what you get out of the box. This is great for development of sandbox, but there's no data replication. There's no redundancy. Don't run your production applications like this, right? And so the next step is kind of your multi-node single data center deployments. This is your kind of you know, standard, typical deployment. Uh, it's a bunch of Cassandra nodes running inside a single data center. It's easy to set up. It's hard to get right. Bit of a shameless plug. Use InstaCluster. We kind of do all the management and configuration deployment for that. Uh, we, uh, it kind of offers a few things over the out-of-the-box configuration, right? You get replication between nodes, redundancy of your data. You know, it increases throughput and storage capacity, stuff like that. So you should probably be using this kind of setup as your baseline for your production clusters. And then the next step, right, is multi-node, multiple DC, which is kind of hard to get right, but it is awesome when it works, right? It's designed for global deployments, and that's, you know, cluster, Cassandra clusters that are spread, like, geographically around the world. Uh, it allows your app and your data store to be located uh, geographically close to each other, and you can also then deploy kind of close to your customers as well. So this is actually supported out of the box in Cassandra, but it's only supported on data centers that have public IP addresses for every node in them. So how is Cassandra like data center aware, right? And that's, that's achieved by this component called Snitch. So the Snitch is how Cassandra understands data centers and racks. It knows which DC and rack a node is located in. And how is that done? So it's, it's either automatic, right? There's uh, an implementation um, called the EC2 multi-region Snitch. Uh, that thing basically uses Amazon's internal API metadata service to determine which rack and data center or region you're currently located in. The other way is to do manual configuration using something like the gossiping properties file snitch, uh, which loads those details such as the rack and the data center from a properties file configured on the thing. Um, other nodes find out this information via Cassandra's internal protocol called gossip. And so that means that every node inside a cluster will eventually determine which data center and which rack a node is located in. And another advantage of every node knowing which data center rack a node is in means that nodes can determine proximity with other nodes. So that kind of gives you sort of an estimate of 
link, link latency, right? Which means that nodes that are kind of close together will, will establish connections and your application can establish connections to the nodes that are closest to yeah. it as well. Uh, one cool thing is that you can actually have multiple implementations of a snitch in a single cluster. So, you know, if for example you're doing a deployment between say Rackspace and Amazon Web Services, obviously the EC2 multi-region snitch won't work in Rackspace. So you can actually deploy the EC2 snitch in EC2 and then do a custom one in Rackspace if you want to. And so what is, it, what is a data center according to Cassandra, right? Um, a data center is basically a collection of racks. Data centers are complete replications of your data. And Cassandra understands that they might be geographically separate with high latency links, right? And so a good example of that is um, East Coast US to Sydney is approximately a 300 millisecond round trip time. You don't want your application kind of connecting to the nodes in the wrong continent, otherwise you're gonna have serious problems. Um, and so yeah, because Cassandra knows about that link, it will, will not establish um, like direct, sorry, it'll establish connections, but it will attempt to use the data closer, no, closer to your application. So uh, the next step is what is a rack, right? Um, a rack is a collection of individual Cassandra nodes, right? And Cassandra understands that a rack might fail as a, as a single unit, right? And Cassandra will ensure, or attempt to ensure, sorry, that there's enough replications of your data inside a DC so that it can um, delegate over to a different node if a rack fails, right? And this is all modeled around the traditional data center deployment thing where you have, you know, racks and cages with um, like UPS devices and the whole thing might actually fail as, as a whole unit. Right? So how does the traditional DC and rack model kind of map into the cloud, right? Um, on Amazon Web Services, it's actually, it's, sorry, this is quite simple, right? On Amazon Web Services, a data center maps to a region, a rack maps to an availability zone. And AWS is auto-configuring if you use the EC2 multi-region snitch. Now, I do apologize, I, I did make a mistake here. Um, when I looked into this, I thought there was no out-of-the-box support for Google Compute, but I did actually check this morning and there is. So there is a Google Compute gossiping snitch as well. Um, and so that gives you out-of-the-box support on Google Compute. Basically the same thing, like data centers map to uh, Google Compute regions and racks map to zones. But of course, sorry, if you're in a data center that doesn't kind of have an automatic configuring thing, you can hard code these values into the, into the properties file, for example, or write your own and commit it to the project. That'd be great. So this basically, all this means is that Cassandra is data center aware, right? And that makes remote data center more expensive. And you can also then write your applications to be DC aware too, right? Um, this means that your application will only attempt to fetch data from the nodes that are closest to it. Like I said before, you know, otherwise you end up connecting across really expensive links and you've got serious latency problems. So how do you make your application DC aware? Well, it's quite simple. Um, as an example here, uh, you know, in, in the Java driver, you can actually specify a DC aware round robin policy with the name of the data center that your application is located in, and then the application will only attempt to connect to the nodes located in that DC. So, like I said before, Cassandra actually has out of the box multi DC support, um, but what does Cassandra work with, right? So, every node must have a public IP address and may optionally have private IP addresses for this to work. So, public addressing is used for inter DC connectivity and private addressing is then used for intra-DC connectivity. So Cassandra understands that you know, some data center deployments such as Amazon, every machine has a public address and a private address allocated to it. And so what Cassandra will do is first attempt to do public address connections and then we'll downgrade to the private addressing if it can establish a connection. And sorry, that's only established within the same data center as well. So this out-of-the-box support great, works great with cloud-to-cloud -cloud deployments, uh, traditional data centers to cloud deployments and traditional to, to, to traditional. And just to clarify, what I mean by traditional here is where every machine has a public IP address. Um, but the thing is, private network clusters into the cloud is a little bit more difficult, right? And the reason for that is most private networks tend to use something like network address translation to share a bunch of public IP addresses with possibly hundreds of machines with private IPs, right? So it's very unusual for this to be kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. And so that kind of poses a whole bunch of problems. Also additionally, like public IP addressing per node is kind of bad. Um, 
we're running out of IPv4 addresses, right? So this graph here shows um, uh, the various regional uh, registry pools of IP addresses around the world. Some have already existed their allocation, sorry, exhausted their allocations and others are forecasted to deplete their allocation in the next couple of years. So this is becoming kind of a serious problem. And you know, it's, it's fine when you've got like a four node cluster, uh, sorry, eight node cluster with four split between two DCs, you know, that's, that's only eight public addresses. But as soon as you're doing t 200 nodes per data center, that starts to get kind of, you know, it's a, it's a bit wasteful. Right? So if you want to be a good internet citizen, it's probably a good idea not to like allocate public addresses to every machine. So like I said, uh, currently the multi-TC support works best with IPv4, um, but with like this address space uh, depletion, probably purchasing new addresses will become more expensive. You'll have to you know, justify your purchasing, all that sort of stuff. So what are some of the other options that we can use for inter-DC connectivity? Right. Well, we could try IPv6, right? Java supports it out of the box. Uh, Cassandra probably does too, although we haven't tested it. Uh, there's a few posts on the mailing list and stuff where people have actually said, yeah, it, it works fine. The thing is, the global adoption of IPv6 is approximately 4%. It depends on, you know, which numbers you look at. Um, like, so that, that number there is according to Google, right? Um, so it's, it's possible to use a IPv6 to IPv4 kind of hybrid, such as Pareto tunneling or 6 over 4, but that requires your data center to be running IPv6 internally, right? And the thing is, Amazon EC2 doesn't support IPv6, so end of story for us. We want to be able to support Amazon EC2. They don't support it, so we have to choose something other than IPv6 as an option. So how about VPNs, right? So this is a fantastic solution for single clusters, right? There's no dual addressing, so you don't have that public-private thing going on. Everything's all private addresses. But there's a few problems, right? Um, the number of VPN connections between your data centers, it grows quite rapidly. Uh, you've got one between every data center and then at least one for every client connecting in. Uh, there's a bunch of tech out there to make this kind of configuration easier. A good example of that is like Tink. Tink is a uh, open source product. It, it makes it really easy to do mesh VPNs. Uh, it's great technology, check it out, right? If you kind of want to do a VPN solution. So some of the problems that we had at InstaCluster uh, with trying to deploy VPNs though is that VPNs are typically implemented at the IP level, right? They're completely transparent to applications. And that becomes a problem if your address spaces overlap. Um, you can't connect to more than one VPN at once, right? Which makes it very difficult from our kind of point where we want to be able to connect to multiple clusters and do management, monitoring, uh, you know, and it, it's also a problem for multi-cluster applications. If your app needs to connect to two clusters over VPNs, you've got to make sure their private addresses uh, don't, or sorry, their address spaces don't conflict. Um, so we kind of had to find something additional, or uh, sorry, another alternative to VPNs. And just to give you an example of like how many VPN links are actually needed between data centers, with seven DCs you need 21 links. Like I said, technology like Tink can actually assist with establishing those additional connections, but still, you know, that's a lot of connections. And if one of them goes down, you've got some problems. And then you also got to add client connectivity in on top of that. So one of the other solutions we came up against uh, was network address translation. This is also called IP masquerading or port address translation. They're all kind of the same tech. Like it, there's there's a few details there that you know, but I won't go into that today. Um, NAT is basically deployed on most private networks already, and this is the configuration that we at InstaCluster want to be able to support, right? Um, like I said before, we want to allow customers that are running a cluster inside their private DC to burst out into the cloud or allow connections back in, right? Uh, the advantage of NAT allows us and clients as well to connect to and manage multiple clusters at once, so it gets rid of that whole VPN problem where you can't connect to, to two overlapping private address spaces. So what is network address translation, right? Um, network, or NAT, sorry, basically remaps address spaces, and that's typically uh, public internet-facing addresses into private networks, right? Uh, it supports multiple public shared addresses, um, sorry, multiple public addresses shared by multiple, or many multiple private addresses. This is typically, you know, like I said, you've got one or two public addresses with hundreds of machines behind your, your NAT. 
Uh, a subcomponent of NAT is port address translation, and this handles the mapping between private ports inside your network to public ports and vice versa. Um, out of the box, NAT is outbound connections only without configuration, right? And another thing that you've got to take into account is that every data center must have a NAT gateway, uh, which would have two network interfaces minimum, right? One facing the public internet, one internal facing, and it's responsible for doing the address mapping. So how do you support inbound connections with NAT? Um, well, you've got a couple of options, right? There's, there's static configuration, so you can go in and configure your gateway. Uh, you know, the software that does that will typically have a configuration file where you can specify um, you know, the, the addressing uh, system that you want to use. Another option is to do automatic uh, configuration, which is typically done by the application, and that's using protocols such as UPnP or NATPnP, stuff like that. Um, and then the third option is using NAT traversal techniques such as uh, Session Traversal Utilities for NAT or STUN or Interactive Connectivity Establishment or ICE, right? But they're kind of out of the scope of this talk, so you know, if you want to find out more about those tech, uh, look it up on Wikipedia. So how do we integrate Network Address Translation and Cassandra? Uh, so let's, let's do a situation here, just keeping it simple. Uh, we've got a bunch of Cassandra nodes uh, with one public IP address per data center. And what we want to do is we want to port four different public ports uh, for each node inside the DC. And that requires at least two, right? Uh, the CQL connectivity port and the thrift connectivity port. And then what we have to do is advertise these assigned ports to external third, third parties or other data centers or clients and then I'll make, modify them to actually use those ports and the gateway address. So how do we advertise port mappings, right? Um, well, one option is to extend Cassandra itself. We extend gossip, uh, include ports and stuff like that, and so the addresses in node announcements. We'd also have to allow the seed node list in the configuration file to be uh, amended with port numbers as well. And we'd also have to modify Cassandra to allow multiple nodes to have identical public and private addresses. And why I say that is Cassandra actually internally uses the IP address of the node as its unique identifier. Um, so there's a problem at the moment where, because it's all only based on address, you'd have, if you've got a NAT deployment situation, uh, every, every node would appear to have the same like, IP address because they're all running through this gateway. Uh, and then you've also got the thing where multiple nodes in each data center can possibly share the same public address and they only differ by port would be the only way to identify them. For us, that was too many modifications, right? We want to make sure that we run as vanilla Cassandra as possible. You know, this kind of stuff, we, we sort of looked into how to do it and we ended up nearly having to touch or thought we'd have to touch, you know, a large amount of the internals of Cassandra. So we don't want to do that, right? The other issue is how do, you, how do you kind of bootstrap this kind of system where if you've got two sets of Cassandra nodes behind uh, two private data centers, how do they actually initially connect to each other, right? You kind of, you need to have some kind of connection establishment system so that the, the gossip protocol can actually initiate and start transferring this information between the nodes. Uh, there's, there's options out there such as uh, SIP or turn servers which allow you to kind of punch through and punch out through a NAT gateway and kind of do session establishment. But we kind of thought, you know, well, that stuff was way too complicated. So um, we decided to not use that. The other thing is that Cassandra itself must also know about the, the, the ports that are allocated to that, which, um, because it would, have, of course, have to advertise these via gossip. This is sort of hard if Cassandra itself is not responsible for doing the port mapping. So if you go back to the, think back to the previous slide where I said, you know, you can do static mappings in your gateway configuration. Uh, Cassandra would not know what the public facing port is to advertise to other nodes in other data centers, you know, how to connect to it. So it, it kind of makes it difficult if Cassandra itself is not responsible for doing that mapping. So the other option that we, we came up with was uh, using DNS service discovery. And so this is the one that, you know, we, we kind of went with. Uh, this has a bunch of other names, uh, ZeroConf, Bonjour, you might be familiar with this. This is how like Macs and iPhones detect each other on local networks. Uh, so it's traditionally multicast, so it works across like local networks, but DNS SD is actually the unicast variant of that. It's basically just DNS, right, with a bunch of, you know, records that are configured in a particular structure that allows you to query for certain amounts of information. 
So read and configuration from this kind of setup is actually really, really easy, right? Existing DNS clients supported out of the box. Uh, it works inside restrictive networks as well, right? So even if you've got a local DNS server that recurses out to the internet, you will be able to read this kind of information because it is just a combination of standard TXT, SRV, and PTR records in your zone file. Now, updating this information, it does depend on your DNS server. Uh, the standard kind of recommended way is to use DNS update, which is a particular protocol, optionally with uh, transaction signatures to kind of do authentication. That sort of uh, setup is supported out of the box with Bind, which is the, the DNS server that's typically run on most Linux deployments. But if you're not running your own DNS or if your DNS provider doesn't support this, um, your DNS server might have an API that allows you to do updates. So a good example of that is Amazon's Route 53, uh, has an API that allows you to modify the zone definition, and that's what we use. So at the core of DNS service discovery, like I said, is uh, SRV and text records, and uh, how, these, how these are laid out is the SRV record contains the host name and the primary port that you should be connecting on, and then TXT records contain basically a bunch of key value pairs. So this is very useful for storing additional configuration details, such as additional ports or you know, anything you can think of basically. So how do we integrate all this into Cassandra? Uh, what, what we do is we basically modify Cassandra's connection code to look up the foreign node details against DNS and then we also update or modify the client drivers to do the same thing. One advantage of this is it's an external system, right? This, all this information can be queried outside of Cassandra and it can also be updated outside of Cassandra, which is great if you want the NAT gateway device itself to be responsible for handling the mappings because it can update DNS, or you can have a central management server. So that's what we have at InstaCluster, where our central management server can actually be responsible for updating the zone definitions. So yeah, it basically means that it can be updated out of band and Cassandra is kind of none the wiser about that this is all going on. So what actually gets advertised uh, in DNSSD? Um, every cluster gets its own what's called a browse domain and uh, that browse domain is basically a collection of records that identifies each node. Uh, every data center we deploy a gateway, which is the NAT gateway device. Uh, its public address is then advertised in an A record inside that browse domain. And then each node service, uh, which is kind of the DNSSD term for like an entry for a, a particular node, uh, we, we advertise an SRV record uh, named based off its, its IP address, right? So we can kind of do a mapping between when Cassandra sees a private IP floating around inside its gossip, we can map that private IP out to DNS as a, as a service record in, in the zone. Uh, EC2, sorry, Route 53 doesn't support dots in their, um, in their service or the, the name of the record, so we replace dots with, with dashes, but that's just kind of a a minor thing. Uh, it depends, I, I believe bind actually allows you to use any character in the, in the service definition, so you know, it depends again on your, on your DNS provider. One slight disadvantage to this solution is that it does require unique private addresses for each uh, node in every DC, but that doesn't mean that those address spaces can't overlap, right? Sorry, they can overlap, but you just need uh, unique addresses for each node. So, you know, y there's a little bit of management required there, but it's not as restrictive as the whole overlapping address space thing. Um, what we'd also do is uh, the SRV record, uh, so the, the host name of that is the uh, gateway, A record, and then the port that's advertised is the thrift port. Other connection details such as the CQL port are advertised in the text record that's associated with this as one of those key value pairs, as I mentioned previously. Um, so how, how do we actually configure this, right? Uh, we, we configure Cassandra only to use uh, private addressing, so it believes it's actually all running inside kind of a single network. Uh, when the cluster is created, we establish a new browse domain in DNS, and like I said, we create an A record for each NAT gateway inside that browse domain. The NAT gateway itself is responsible for updating DNS uh, SD, so it, it modifies the zone records. And the way that that works is the, the gateway itself is notified when a new node starts up inside the data center. It configures all the port mapping as well, so it allocates random ports public facing and configures the forwarding rules to the, the standard Cassandra ports running on the private machines. And then this is all advertised on DNS SD. So the gateway device updates the browse domain. With that information, it creates new SRV text and pointer records to the nodes. 
So to give you a kind of example of what this looks like when it's running, um, using, using the uh, DNS SD command, which is uh, built into Mac OS X, you can use uh, Abahai Browse on Linux if you want. Uh, you can also use DIG or any other DNS querying tool because like I said before, this is actually just DNS, right, under the hood. Uh, so uh, what, what we do at the top there is we browse for Cassandra services on a domain. Um, as you see here, uh, so there's a unique domain for this cluster and that cluster has six nodes located in two data centers. And the way that we identify that is, um, you'll notice that some of them have uh, a one in the addressing scheme and the others have got a two. So we've got two subnets there, right? Um, so yeah, you'll notice that the instance names are listed down the sides. Uh, and that's how we look up details like on a per node basis. When Cassandra receives uh, the fact that there's a new node in Gossip, um, it can then uh, look up the, the record in DNSSD against that instance name because it's just the IP address. Uh, then if we want to actually look up the details for the node, we can, we can specify that service entry as a, as, a, as a query and you'll see there that um, what gets returned is the gateway host name and the thrift port. So the host name is the, the green text and the thrift port is the, the blue identifier there. Uh, and then lastly, what we do is uh, we, we query the address of the gateway machine just as a standard uh, NS lookup and you'll see there that it then returns, like that's our EC2 public facing address. So if you were to connect to, uh, what's the port there? 1236 on that public address, you would connect to the thrift port on the Cassandra machine inside the private network. So just a quick overview of how we kind of went about modifying the client drivers to kind of handle this kind of kind of system. Um, luckily the data stack drivers out of the box, they actually support this concept called address translators, which is pretty cool. Uh, what these do is they take an address and port combination and allow you to translate that combo into an alternative uh, address and port number. Uh, so what we do is we create our own uh, address translator class, which is then used um, when uh, the, the driver tries to establish a connection. And uh, those are connections are either the ones that establish to the contact points or the ones that to new nodes that are to discovered via gossip, right? Uh, our private translator, or sorry, our, our address translator, um, translates private internal addresses, which is what's advertised on gossip, to the public IP address and port combinations. And this is achieved by querying DNS as before, right? We attempt to find a service with a name matching the private IP and that then resolves to the gateway IP address eventually and the, the port numbers that you need to connect to. How do we modify Cassandra as well? Because obviously if you've got multiple DC deployments, you want Cassandra nodes to be able to talk to each other. Uh, so what we do is we modify the outbound TCP connection pool class and that class is actually responsible for establishing socket connections between uh, Cassandra instances. Uh, there's a function in there called new socket and we modify that basically in the same way as the, as the driver. Uh, we, it it kind of gets a, um, an endpoint parameter which is the private IP address of the node. We look up that private IP address in DNS and uh, then receive the gateway IP and public port and then create a new socket on that address combination rather than the internal private address that it was originally going to connect to. So just to give you a kind of, you know, here's a diagram that hopefully explains how some of this works. Um, the purple lines are the DNS SD lookups. So as you see, we've got the, the um, Cassandra nodes in the right data center. One of them wants to connect to another node in the, the left-hand data center. So it does a DNS SD lookup when it attempts to establish that connection and then uh, does a connection outwards through its NAT gateway to the public port on the uh, left-hand data center, which then is routed to the appropriate node that it was connecting to. And the same happens for clients as well. The client application will attempt, it will do a DNS lookup first and then establish the connection to the NAT gateway of the data center uh, where the node is located. And that about wraps it up. So.